All right, well, good morning and welcome to our teaching on Sunday mornings. We're going verse by verse in our study through the Bible, and today we are in 1 Timothy, and our text will be verses 12 through 16 in chapter 1. Those of you that are here can turn there if you're not there already. But before we get started, I wanted to let you know about this Thursday, uh, August 6th at 7 p.m. here. We'll begin with worship and then we'll live stream it at 7.30 p.m. Hawaii time. We're going to have Kalo TV here for a panel discussion that is titled Social Justice, A Kingdom Perspective. And my assistant pastor, Mac, along with Samuel Garner, will answer questions moderated by Malala Po of Kalo TV on how this current generation is being misled and deceived, and how the Black Lives Matter movement has been able to create this culture of division, especially with young people. And this is kind of what it's going to be geared towards. And they're also going to discuss where those who believe in Jesus Christ should stand on these issues and the appropriate response from the church as well. So uh, if you're able to come, we'd certainly encourage you to do so. You might want to come early. Uh, we are expecting a lot of people. Uh, and it will be uh, live streamed on Kahlo's app. Uh, we'll live stream it on YouTube. Actually, it's going to be live streamed on Kahlo's YouTube channel as well. And then it will be aired on Kahlo TV uh, afterwards as well. So I want to let you know about that. Hopefully you're able to come out. And uh, if so, 7 o'clock and then 7.30 online. Let's get into the Word. I've been really looking forward to today's teaching. I think you're going to see why here in a moment. Chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. Can I ask you to stand? You can follow along as I read. If not, where you're seated is fine. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, a young pastor, and in verse 12 says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that He considered me trustworthy, appointing me to His service, even though, verse 13, I was once a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent man, certainly a reference to how he had Christians killed before he came to Christ. He says, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, verse 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His immense patience as an example for those who would believe in Him and receive eternal life. Wow. Let's pray. Ask God to bless this to our understanding, if you would join with me. Thank you, Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to You for Your Word and this portion that we have before us today. Lord, I know that You have a Word fitly spoken for us today. And Lord, I also know that the enemy will do whatever he can to get our minds to wander and distract us so that we miss 
what it is that you want to speak into our lives and minister to us. So Lord, will you, as only you can, and as you're always so faithful to, get our attention so that we can give you our undivided attention and keep our attention by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So, what I'm hoping to do today is answer this question. You see it there on the screen. It's the question of, what can I do? (laughs) In light of, and especially with everything that's happening in the world today? And it's a good question. And actually, I've been asked this question. I've been on the receiving end of many emails from people saying, man, I mean, what, what can we do in concert with prayer? What, what can we do in light of everything that's happening? And that's a very good question. But I want to emphasize, highlight, underscore the word or the letter I. So the question is more like this. It's not, what can I do? It's more like this. What can I do? In the sense of, what can someone like little old me do? I mean, (laughs) I'm just a nobody. I mean, I'm not only not in the who's who, I'm in the who's he. I love that one. I totally stole that from Gail Irwin, but it's mine now. So, but I'm a nobody. I mean, how's God going to use somebody like me? Or worse yet, how about this one? God can't choose to use someone like me because of my past. Or the reality is, is that I'm really not qualified, so God can't use me. Enter the text before us today, where the Apostle Paul uses his own life and his own sordid past as a murderer of Christians, thinking he was helping God out. He was doing God a favor. Oh, how much blood of Christians did he have on his hands? Some even suggest, and we're not told specifically, what that thorn in the flesh was that he writes about to the Corinthian church that was this messenger from Satan that would torment him day and night, all day, every day, all night, every night. We're not told what it was. Some speculate and suggest that what he was so tormented by, and the reason why he wanted God to remove it, is because the the enemy had tormented him day and night about all of the blood that he had on his hands from those Christians that he had killed. Stephen being the first, by the way. Certainly, Paul would qualify, if I can use that word, as the last person on planet earth to ever get saved, let alone to ever be used. (laughs) But not in God's economy. I mean, if you were in that day friends with someone like Saul of Tarsus, and you were a believer, and you were with other Christians, you would be praying for him, thinking to yourself as you're praying for him, Lord, bring Saul to you, to a saving knowledge. Save Saul. And then deep down inside you're going, it's never going to happen. Are you kidding me? And yet not only does God save him, God uses him in such a mighty way. If you were to ask me what I thought 
was one of the main reasons that God is unable to use us in mighty ways, this would be it. And by that I mean, we wrongly believe that there's really nothing that we can do to make a difference. So what do we end up doing? Nothing at all. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. By the way, if you see me as your pastor, that would be a profound honor for me. Uh, I want you to know that this is my resume right here. Okay. This, right here. This is my resume. We're going to read my resume. Ready? Paul writing, brothers and sisters, <laughs> think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. <clears throat> Not many of you were influential. <clears throat> Not many of you were of noble birth, but God. Oh, I love those two words. Give me just a moment here. It changes everything. Those two words. But God, and here it is, chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Why? Verse 29, because it's so that no one may boast before Him. That's why. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Because no flesh is going to glory in His presence. Nobody can take the credit for that which God alone does. You know, <laughs> I, nothing wrong with having a formal education. I have no formal education. Nothing wrong with, you know, that. I, I barely graduated from high school. I graduated from high school by the hair of my chinny chin chin. No, that's literally, I barely graduated. I got suspended, and they were threatening me that they would not, that I would not graduate. It was just by the grace of God, I think, that I graduated. But, and, 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 you know, you know how they have that most likely to succeed, voted most likely to succeed. You know, and, and in the yearbook, you know, the, the, my senior year, you know, they had the picture, and then down below the picture of, of the senior, it had all the lists of the accomplishments, you know, high school, I mean, uh, you know, cheerleader head and, you know, uh, uh, ASB. Boy, it's been so long. I don't even remember what they call it anymore. Assistant student body president, you know, and letterman's club and this club and that club. And you know what there was below my name, my picture? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. No thing. It was just white. It's like a big blank white space. They even had to move the picture underneath up to, you know. Anyway, enough of my problems, but I, I'm actually going somewhere with this. I was the last person on the planet you would have ever thought. In fact, my classmates to this day are very confused. <laughs> You're a pastor? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like God chooses the foolish to confound the wise. Get it? So that that way there's no way I can stand up here and say, yeah, have you seen my resume? Have you seen my credentials? Have you seen all the letters at the end? Of Again, nothing wrong with this. All the letters at the end of my name. I have none. That's why I Changed my name to put letters. So I had letters, J.D. <laughs> you 
You know what I love is when somebody says, wow, Pastor JD, (laughs) if God can use somebody like you, He can use me. Now my first response in the flesh is, wow, that was really insulting. (laughs) Because you just basically said that, you know, I mean, you're the, that's exactly the point. And that's what Paul's saying. The worst of the worst, the last of the last, the least of the least. So that that way they look at a life like the Apostle Paul, they look at a life like a Pastor JD, and they say, that's God. (laughs) It's not him. I know him. I knew him. I went to school with him. It's not him. It's the Lord. God gets all the glory. Chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. The weak things. Shame the strong. That way he alone gets all the glory. I would suggest that this passage we just read in 1 Corinthians and our text here in 1 Timothy answers for us the question of what can I do? Little old me. Mrs. Mrs. Nobody, Mr. Nobody. (laughs) If you really think about it, it's not really me doing anything. Rather, it's the Lord doing everything in me and through me, so He alone gets the glory. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do no thing. I looked that up in the original language. You know what that means? No thing. There's nothing you can do apart from me. There's no good thing. No good can come of you. I I hate to say this, but and I've shared this. And um, my dad used to always say, "You're good for nothing." Explains a lot, you know. Growing up, I heard that all the time. You're good for nothing. You're going to amount to nothing, boy. And he always said it in a mean, you know, with his, you know, uh, accent, you know, boy. He always said, call me boy. I have a name. You name me. <laughs> boy, you are good for nothing. You will amount to nothing. Cool, because God takes the the nobodies, the nothings, and he does everything because he can. Have you ever heard it like this? I'll never forget, I I was sitting under the teaching of God's Word, and the pastor said the following, some of us are too strong for God to use. I'm like, Oh, that's me. No, no, I, I was sure everybody was looking at me because that was me. I'm too strong for God to use. He can't use me because I'm too strong in the strength of my own might. It's when I'm weak that I'm strong. That's what Paul would boast about. I do nothing. He does everything. I want to share with you two reasons. That God, as only He can, takes the ordinary and does the extraordinary. (laughs) Despite who we are, or even what we've done in the past, as sordid as it might be. The first one is in verse 12, and it's that God's calling is God's enabling. I don't know if it's possible to overstate the importance of what Paul says here when he says that God is the source of his strength. That is how he is able to do anything. He's using his own life as an example of how God can use anybody to do anything. 
One of the things I'm learning in my own walk with the Lord is that God will never call me or even command me to do anything unless He also enables me to do it. Think about it. God cannot set us up to fail or else He would be party to our disobedience. And that's impossible. That's not who God is. That's inconsistent with the character and nature of God. I think of it like this. God will always create and orchestrate a scenario in my life that is conducive to my obedience. He's always going to lead me in the right path. He's never going to, he just can't. He can't tempt to do evil. It's not possible. He'll never create a scenario that, that is conducive to my disobedience. In fact, it's the opposite that's true. So He calls me, He commands me. Certainly in Scripture we have many places where we're exhorted to do something. Any exhortation, any command, any call from the Lord comes packaged with the power and the strength and the enabling to do it. God will always enable you to do that which He has commanded you to do. I know this is in proper English. I guess it's a double negative, I'm told. But He can't not. I'll give you a moment. I know that's deeply profound. He is incapable of doing anything but that. He's going to enable you. He's going to empower you to do that which He has called you to do. I love Philippians 4.13. I know it's a life verse for many. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's flip that around if you don't mind. And this is good to do sometimes when you're reading and studying Scripture. Let's flip that to the other side of the table. If I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, wouldn't it stand the reason that I can do no thing if I don't have Christ who strengthens me? Ephesians 3 verse 16, he's praying for the church there in Ephesus. And he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, I'm going to add inexhaustible riches. (laughs) He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. That's it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Check it out. We're commanded to be ye holy as He is holy. How am I going to do that? Oh, I got good news for you. You're not. Well, then how am I going to be holy? The Holy Spirit. Holy life, Holy Spirit. You cannot live a holy life absent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables you, empowers you to live a holy life. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. The best, I mean the best illustration I ever heard was that of a canoe, which we can relate to here in Hawaii. You got it on the beach. You want to get it into the water. So there you are. You're pushing, striving, using all your strength, all your might, all your power, and that thing ain't budging. So you call over some of the brothers. Hey, they try to push. No, no go, bro. <laughs> then all of a sudden, here comes a wave. Here comes the water. And all of a sudden now, this canoe that we couldn't budge, I, I use my pinky. It's in the water. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, different than in us, and empowers us, our lives will become like torrents of living water. 
You see those floodwaters? How powerful they are? I mean, my goodness, here's a house like a little toy being taken downstream because of the power of the water. Again, not something we're familiar with here in Hawaii, but where I come from (laughs) on the mainland. You know that our electricity, our power comes from water? They call them dams. They harness the power of the water to create electricity. It is so powerful. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me just say this and we'll move on to the second one, which I want to spend the remainder of our time on. But don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't believe his lies. When he says to you, you can't do that. In fact, you know what? Agree with him. Say, you know what? (laughs) You devil, because that's what he is. Um, You're right about that. I can't do this. But God can. You know the three-step program? I mean, no disrespect to any step program, but there's really a three-step program. Step one, acknowledge, realize, know you can't. Step two, know He can. Step three, let Him. Let Him. You know, I, in my own walk with the Lord over the years, because I'm, well, I know they have clinical terms for my condition, but you know, I'm just, I'm, you know, especially when I was younger, I had more energy. And I'm just, just dr- driven, you know, I'm going to make it, I'm going to roll up my arm sleeves, pull myself up by the bootstraps, whatever that means. And I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to do this. Watch me now. And then I I just picture the Lord going, okay, I'll watch. Let me know. I'll I'll be here when you're done. When you come to the end of yourself, and you throw up your hands, and you go, God, I have made a complete mess. I knew you would. I, I messed this up so bad. Lord, I can't do this. To which I could just hear the angels given charge concerning me saying, it's about time. What is up with you? So it's like, God, I can't do this. It's like, I can just almost imagine God saying, well, I can. Will you let me do it? Can I I do this now? I mean, it's going to take me a little bit longer. You know how cute your kids are and how adorable it is when they want to help you when they're young. Oh, Baba, Baba, can I help? Can I help? You're thinking, "Uh, okay, so cute. I'm not going to say no. You know, maybe there's a teachable moment here. I know they're only three, but hey, whatever. You know, so they help you out. You know that it's going to take you three hours to do that, which you could have gotten done in about 30 minutes because they just you know, made a bigger, I think we do that with the Lord. We want to help out. Believe me when I say, God does not need our help. Ask Abraham and Sarah about that. Let's help God out. You know, because apparently it's, this is uh, kind of a tall order. I'm I'm like 90 years old. I don't know if you haven't noticed, honey, but, and then here's Abraham. He's 100 years old, and that ship sailed a long time ago. <laughs> Sorry for the southern accent. So what do they do? Well, they try to help God out in the energy of their own strength, and they birth an Ishmael, a type of the flesh, that would war against Isaac, a type of the spirit, for the rest of human history. I I hate to say this, but I have a lot of Ishmael's out there that I birthed in the energy of my own strength, all because I would not wait and let the Lord do it. 
The second one is, again, the one I want us to spend the remainder of our time on together today. It's in verses 13 through 16. And it's that God takes bad and makes good. Let me explain this one. Here, Paul, <laughs> love this about Paul, very openly, very honestly, says that he's the worst of the worst. And basically, he's saying that if God can save me, he can save anybody. If God can use me, God can use anybody. I mean, think about it. What he's saying is, it doesn't matter how bad you are or were, it only matters how good God is. I don't know how. I certainly don't know when. I just by faith know that God can take anything as bad as it might seem and work it together for the good. I know that's Romans 8, 28. We love that verse, don't we? That promise. It's also Genesis 50, 20, when Joseph says to his brothers, what you did to me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, as only God can, to bring it about the salvation of many this day. The Scriptures are replete with men and women who, despite their sinfulness, God in His goodness brought about usefulness. Despite who they were, despite what they did. Would you join me in Matthew chapter 1? I want to read verses 1 through 6. Uh, I have to warn you, it's a genealogy. You know what I'm talking about? It's the, you know, begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat. You know, you know the, the part of Scripture where you just kind of skip over? Because it's a bunch of names. And I mean, if you were to try, you can't pronounce them. I'm going to do my best. I mean, you'll forgive me in advance if I pronounce Hebrew names with an Arabic, uh, you know, accent uh, or uh, translation or pronunciation. But this is the genealogy of Jesus the Christ. There's a couple of things I want us to look at here. A couple of details that at first read you might miss, and then upon closer examination you go, oh, I see why God deemed it necessary by the Holy Spirit to include that detail that seems so out of place. This is the genealogy, verse 1, of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Hold on to that. We're going to come back to that. Interesting. Perez, these were twins, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nahshon, Nahshon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Abed, whose mother was Ruth, Abed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. What? 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 Why, why is that there? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Hang on to that one too. I want to come back to that one as well. Very interesting. Why do we need to know that? Oh. Do you know who, who this Tamar is? Do you know what? I, we all know who Judah was. But do you, do you know what Judah did? 
Genesis 38. Seemingly out of place in 2007, 2008. It took us a couple of years to go through the book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But it was in 2008, we were in chapter 38 of Genesis. Fascinating study. But <laughs> there it is, chapter 38, in between 37 and 39. Very profound in and of itself, right? But what makes it so interesting is that it's all about the life of Joseph. And then out of nowhere, it's like parenthetically, stop, Joseph, pause, push pause. We're going to talk about Judah. What happened with Judah? Oh, chapter 38 tells you. So here's what happens. His first mistake was he marries a Canaanite wife first mistake. He has three sons. His uh, first son marries this Tamar that's here in Matthew 1. And we're told in Genesis 38 that he was so wicked that God killed him. What? God killed him? Yeah. Why? Because he was so wicked. Wow. What's up with that? Well, some suggest that it was actually God's grace because he was lessening his eternal judgment by cutting his life off early and also protecting others for whom he could pose a danger and threat of harm. So God kills him. We're not told. We don't want to know. I don't want to know what he did that was so wicked that God would kill him. So now she's a widow. So as was the custom in that day, you would take now the brother, he would have to marry the widow of his older brother and give her a son that would actually be his older brother's son to carry on the family name and also get the family inheritance. So the second son marries Tamar and he doesn't want to give her a son. I won't get into the details. And so God kills him too. We're not doing so good. Now there's a third son. And here's Judah saying, you know what, Tamar, listen, I, I love you. You're my daughter-in-law. But you married my first son, he's dead. You married my second son, he's dead. I don't want you to marry my third son. <laughs> if you know what I mean. He doesn't say that, but he doesn't have to. He basically says, hey, why don't you go back to your parents' house and wait till he's old enough, and then I'll, I'll let you marry him. He has no intention of letting her marry him. And she knows it too, by the way. So a few months go by, and Judah's wife dies. So now he's a widower. And the time has come, as it does every year, where they go to shear their sheep. And it's kind of a big thing, and I hate to compare it to this, but sadly it's uh, very much like this. Nothing new under the sun. You know, during the Super Bowl and Olympics, they bring in uh, prostitutes and trafficked women uh, for the men for these events. Well, that's what they did. They brought in these prostitutes for the sheep shearers, so someone goes to Tamar and says, hey, do you know that your uh, father-in-law, Judah, by the way, this is the same Judah that sold Joseph, whose story has been interrupted, into slavery. That Judah, he was the one responsible. I want to come back to that. that that's, there's a significance in that. So they go to Tamar and say, hey, Tamar, your father-in-law, Judah, is going to be at the sheep share uh, event. So she takes off her widow's garments, puts on the garments of a prostitute, and disguises herself, and goes. And here comes Judah. And he sees her. He doesn't recognize her. And he says, I, I would like to go in and lay with you. I'm trying to be as King James as I can here. So, <laughs> you know, just. <laughs> so she's like, well, um, what, what, what are you going to pay me? He says, well, I'll give you a goat. I don't, have a, I don't happen to have a goat with me. She says, well, then I need a pledge just to make sure that you're going to make good on it. And so why don't you give me your staff and 
your signet ring in particular, which was your ID, by the way. That was your ID. And then when you send the goat, I'll give you this back, and it will, will be fair and square. He agrees, goes in, lays with her. And she conceives. She gets pregnant. Well, he goes off. He still doesn't know, this is Tamar. You have to understand that in that day, in that culture, if you didn't have sons, you were sentenced to a life of utter and abject poverty. And if you didn't have a husband. So Judah goes back, sends his man, take this goat, give it to this prostitute. They take the goat. They can't find her. She's not there. They come back to Judah and say, Judah, sorry, can't find her. He says, well, at least I tried. That was his response. So then a little bit of time goes by and Judah is informed. This is bad news, Judah. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but your daughter-in-law, Tamar, she's pregnant by prostitution. What should we do? Judah goes, well, according to the law, we need to burn her, bring her. Who oh, is he? In, I, you know, there are times when you just want to be a fly on a camel in the Old Testament. <laughs> I would have just loved to see the expression on his face when Tamar shows up and she's queried, did, what did you do? And she says, I became pregnant by the man to whom this staff and signet ring belong. <laughs> Busted! <laughs> And he says, you are more righteous than I. So not only is she pregnant with a son, she's pregnant with twins. And the time has come for her to now give birth. And the midwife, as was the custom, when the first baby came out, they would tie a scarlet thread on the firstborn to identify the firstborn. And that's what Perez does. He starts to come out, she ties the scarlet thread, and he goes back in. I think it's more comfortable in here, I don't know. And then his twin, Zira, comes out, technically the secondborn, and then Perez comes out with the scarlet thread. Perez, by the way, is uh, in the Hebrew means breakthrough. <laughs> Perfect. So let me see if I got this straight. In the ancestry, the genealogy of the Savior of the world is a woman by the name of Tamar that disguised herself as a prostitute and seduced her father-in-law and got pregnant and had twin boys from which one would come the savior of the world. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's disturbing. Are you disturbed? I'm very disturbed. I've always been disturbed by this. Because if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> you got prostitution and incest going on here. In the genealogy of the Savior? The, listen, hey, this is why I'm not God. But if I was God, I would not do that. I'm just saying. <laughs> right? And neither would you either, Right? I mean, is it, and even if it was that, I would not want you to know that. By the way, let's talk about Joseph again. Since we interrupted his life, the account of his life, Joseph, a type of Christ. Why, pray tell, would God deem it necessary in the inspiration of the writing of the canon of Scripture, place chapter 38 right smack in the middle of 37 and 39 about Joseph. 
and tell us about this. I mean, this is TMI, right? <laughs> Too much information concerning Judah, okay? Why would he do that? Here's another question that we'll answer the first. Why didn't God have the Savior of the world come from Joseph instead of Judah? Think this through with me. If the genealogy of the Savior of the world came from the likes of a Joseph, what does that say to you and me? God can only use a Joseph. In other words, God, God, God chose Judah. Foolish choice. That's the point. I wouldn't have chose Judah. That's the point. So that only God gets the glory. And furthermore, if God can bring the Savior of the world through a Judah, what about you? Aren't you glad it wasn't Joseph? Have you studied the life of Joseph? Man, I'll tell you, after we got done with the life of Joseph in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, I had to go back and ask the Lord if I was still saved. I mean, this guy was, I mean, I would have never, you, you, you sold me into slavery, but God rah, has given me, now I'm going to, you're off with your heads. Yeah. <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> but not Joseph. Surely the Savior is going to come from a Joseph. No, he's going to come from a Judah. <laughs> and not just from a Judah who sold Joseph into slavery. Ah, oh, I can't wrap my mind around this. Tamar seduces him. She's his daughter-in-law. Are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> Let's talk about David. <laughs> Our study of the life of David in First and Second Samuel, and the Kings and the Chronicles as well. Certainly the Psalms. Man, when we studied through the book of Psalms and the Oh, those Psalms of David, man, the sweet Psalmist of Israel, King David, from whom the Savior of the world would come. But he's a murderer and he's an adulterer. Two capital crimes for which under the law at that time, were punishable by death. That David. And don't you find it interesting? I do. I think you do too. Here we have this genealogy of the Savior of the world, and we're told that David is the, you know, father of Solomon. And oh, by the way, his mother was, used to be Uriah's wife. What happened? Did they get a divorce? No. Well, why isn't she his wife anymore, because David had him killed. But the Savior of the world is going to come from them. Uh, you know who, who this is, right? It's Bathsheba, but don't tell anybody. No. What's your point, Pastor? Maybe some of you are asking, do you even have a point? Yes, I do. <laughs> Boy, do I. Here's the takeaway. Here's the point. If God can use these people to bring the Savior of the world, He can use us to bring Jesus to the world. I think uh, we don't have any more excuses, do we? Would you agree that if there was ever a time to bring Jesus to a lost and dying world, that time is now? 
I want to close by encouraging anyone who, like myself, never dreamt in a million years that God would ever use someone like me. I would encourage you to surrender yourself anew to Him so He can. And I promise you, if you do, (laughs) well, two things. Number one, you'll be hanging on for dear life. And number two, you will have the time of your life. You know, I always know that I've made a very good decision when my only regret is that I didn't make it sooner. And if I had to do it over again, I, I came later. You know, I'm, uh, you know, bless their hearts, these younger pastors that get into the ministry in their 20s. Oh, I didn't even know my own name in my 20s. You know, good for them. But for me, it was like, I mean, I'm in my 40s, right? And better late than never, they say. But if I had to do it over again, my only regret is that I did not surrender to Him sooner and say, Lord, take my life. Use me however you see fit, no matter what it is. Here am I, Lord. Send me. And then just hang on. Here's what will happen. He'll ruin you for Him. And you'll only regret that you didn't let Him ruin you for Him sooner. Because once you surrender to Him, again, talking about Gail Irwin, I don't don't know that all of you know who he is, but um, he made a comment one time, and it just really stuck with me. And and, um, I I stole that one too, so it, it goes like this. The only thing that makes me really wonder about God and question God, is that He would choose and use somebody like me. That's a head scratcher, that God would use somebody like me. But don't you get it? He wants to use somebody like you, because then people are going to look at you, and they're going to say the same thing they said about Paul. No way. 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 Yeah. Not, not him. Yeah. Not her, no way. Way. Oh, it's not them. I know. It has to be God. That's the point. That's the point. One last thing. Did I already say one last thing? Okay. Well, anyway, this is the last thing. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, pastor, come on. Easy for you to say. I mean, you're the pastor. I mean, come on, what am I going to, I'm not a pastor. Good, fine. Actually, you don't want to be a pastor. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, did, I just, I, I don't really have, you know, the, the people skills. I don't have, you know, I, I, I kind of freeze up and, you know, close up and, you know, I, I can't really, what can I do? What if I told you that you have before you the greatest and grandest of opportunities behind your computer screen, online? Why not uh, tweet on Twitter a verse of Scripture that God really minister to you, and then somebody, or a meme, just to encourage somebody. And then you get some responses or likes, and then maybe enter into a a dialogue with them. Encourage them. Tell them you're praying for them. How about this one? This is, uh, I don't recommend this just for anybody. This is something that the Lord has to really be calling you and leading you to do. But why not go on a thread? I'm going to use Twitter as an example and find out what's trending. And I dare you, (laughs) 
you better have the height of a rhinoceros before you do. But <laughs> uh, you have to be thick skinned and be ready. But I dare you to engage. Maybe post the scripture. Say, I don't know what Jesus you're talking about, but this is the Jesus of the Bible. I mean, don't say it like that. That's, oh man, you're asking for it if you do that. You'll be more gracious than I, I would be. But just, and here's the thing, don't, don't assume <laughs> that there's not people out there. In fact, that's why they're on there, on those threads. Don't assume that they're not just waiting, even longing for someone like you to go on there and post something like that. You never know. You never know. God's Word never returns void. You could post a verse and think, I, I, well, why not? And that's exactly what that person needed to hear. That's the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, that's a great opportunity. I mean, you have fingers, right? Use them. You have a computer, use it. Don't use it for arguing. <laughs> That's a, uh, shouldn't have gone there. We talked about that. You can do that, right? Okay, this will be the last, last thing. Okay. So I'm in the store this last week again. And I wear the mask because I just, don't want to create a federal case and get into a, you know, an argument. And so I wear the mask in Jesus name. Going through the checkout. Here's this young man. And you got to know that guy has probably had his fill of frustrated irritated, agitated customers go through his checkout with their mask. And he's got to wear a mask too. He's been wearing it longer than you. So you come up through the checkout. You totally blow him away. And you say, hey, how you doing? No, no, how are you really doing? Because we say, hey, you doing? Fine. How are you? Fine. What if you, what if so, by the way, what if somebody said, we said, hey, how are you doing? They said, do you really want to know? Oh, no, I just was being, you know, I didn't expect you to say that. You got a minute? I actually don't. We'll do lunch. Why don't you ask them? Hey, how you doing? How you really doing? You, you holding up okay? How's it going? I'm hanging in there. That's good. Hang in there. Hanging in there is good. Be sure hanging in there. And then even say something like I did just this last week. I said, I bet you get a lot of customers that are, I, and, and I always go out of my way to say, I'm not one of those customers. And they're like, you're not. <laughs> Poor guy. And then before I leave, I'll say something to the effect of, hey, have a blessed rest of the day. I'll be praying for you. They're like, you will? The, the last customer that went through my checkout was dropping F-bombs and you're going to pray for me? Yeah. Wow. I can do that. I can do that. I can't do a prophecy update, but I can do that. Then do it. Okay, I'm done. Stand up. We'll pray. <laughs> I guess I'll just end on that note. <laughs> One of the things I'm trying to learn to do is end the sermon when it's actually over. <laughs> don't, don't keep going. <laughs> Let's have the worship team come up. We'll close in prayer. Oh, God bless you. God loves you. God wants to use you. He can use you. Even you, especially you. Father in heaven, thank you so much. God, you're so good. Thank you so much for guys like Judah, 
even David, (laughs) and certainly the Apostle Paul. I mean, they give us hope that if you can do what you did through them, in, in spite of them, man, you can do anything. Lord, I pray that you would use us in these last days, these last moments of world history in a mighty way for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.